Noted linguist James Paul G. calls for the education establishment's embrace of the concept of situated and embodied learning, that is, learning that takes place in the same context in which it is applied, learning by doing rather than learning by simply studying about. In G's own words, what I'm pushing is situated and embodied learning. And what I mean by that is being able to solve problems with what you know, not just know a bunch of inert facts, but be able to use facts and information as tools for problem solving in specific contexts, being able to do stuff, learning where you can do and articulate your knowledge. Within the field of education itself, a great example of situated and embodied learning is the practice of student teaching. Prospective teachers, often after having completed extensive coursework about the theories behind teaching, apprentice under a more experienced educator in a real classroom setting. To explore the effect of situated and embodied learning versus more traditional learning, I interviewed a mentor teacher, student teacher pair at the Cayman International School. CIS is a multicultural international school located on Grand Cayman in the Cayman Islands. It provides both a U.S. and international educational environment to over 500 students from more than 30 countries. Matt Crute teaches grade four at CIS, and this year he also mentored student teacher Leanne Corin. Besides being the parent of two students at CIS, Leanne is also studying for her teaching degree via online classes at the University of Sunderland in the United Kingdom. Now, nearing the end of her coursework, and she is completing her practice teaching at CIS in Matt's fourth grade classroom. I asked them to tell me about the process of entering into the classroom community. So when, when I first entered the classroom with Matt, I spent a week at the back of the classroom observing the kids um, also for, for me to observe them and get to know them, but also that they uh, were comfortable with having another adult in the classroom and who I was and what I'd be doing here. And by the end of that week, I was acting like a teacher's assistant. So if hands were going up and Matt was busy with one of the children, I could then go over and help them. And so they got more comfortable asking me questions and having me instruct them. And after the first week, I started teaching. But then when she entered the classroom, she, she did this really well. She completely changed her hat into a teacher hat and took it over the teacher role. And it was really cool to see her go from the parent perspective as when she's focusing on one child and taking all the things that she'd learned so far about assessment and about differentiation and applying them to the whole class. And she said, Trying to get started in the classroom was running beside a speeding train. That was the analogy she used because there were so many things already laid out and in place that she had to catch up and sort out before she could jump in. So that observation time where she was given time where she could go through all of the curriculum and all of the previous learning and all of the anecdotal records and sort that out so that she could leap onto the train and she could carry on as a teacher instead of just participating as a parent, she was then planning and developing lessons for the entire class. Next, I asked Matt and Leanne about the shadowing involved in the kind of apprenticeship that is student teaching. For the first week she followed every move I made, she was there with me and she would follow um, morning routines, she would come in early and, and see what we would happen before in preparation for the day and then as the day went she would observe not only myself, but she'd observe the literacy coach. She'd observe the students and children interacting with the music teacher and the history teacher, how they behave and what is expected in tech class from the tech coordinator. And she would shadow myself in the classroom and we'd go over lesson plans before they started 
then after the lesson we go back over and see what worked, what didn't, how we could change it into when she took over the classroom. So she shadowed prior to the lesson. During the lesson she took her own observations and then after the lesson we would assess. That week I was looking a lot at the relationship that he had with the class, how he managed behavior and things like that. Prior to that I had been in here for a few classes to observe for the theory course that I was doing, but I was looking less at, the, at his interaction with the children and more on specific teaching theories that I was studying. Than, than the first week that I was here, which was how does he interact with the children, what are the different characteristics. Um, so I was looking at him differently um, over those two periods of shadowing. Feedback is an important aspect of the mentor-student relationship. Here, Matt and Leanne each discuss how it has helped her learn. Each day he's giving me feedback on the go. And I also use him in the classroom. So if I'm, if I'm teaching and he's at his desk, um, I will, and, and I like that, I, I will say as I'm talking to the kids, if, if we need another opinion or what does Mr. Matt think, and he will chime in as he's going, even if it's not an official observation. So feedback is ongoing constantly. So she developed lessons and schemes of work and we discussed, we worked on them together, we discussed them, we developed them further, we thought of different ways of differentiating and managing behaviors and managing students and managing the space and getting all of that sorted. And then when she was in her lesson, I usually let her do her thing while I took notes or recorded observations that I saw. And then after the lesson, we would go back and discuss. And often, which was really cool, she would already recognize what, what she could tweak or change. And if she hadn't changed it in the lesson, she was mentally or in plan book already there, ready with possible solutions. Finally, I explored with Matt and Leanne how the situated and embodied nature of the student teaching experience differs from more traditional styles of learning. She came to me and she's like, I want to change the way the desks are laid out. I'm like, that's a great idea. We change every two weeks, so switching it up, the kids will be fine with that. She's like, I've read a ton of books, I've taken classes on it, but I don't really know how to start or what to do. She's like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I always start with a certain handful of children that I know are like oil and water. They just don't mix. So I start with those and I place them around. And we just started hashing it out on the board. And she's like, well, what about this? And Leanne had a lot of great ideas and suggestions. And it just, it was a smooth like partnership. It just went so smoothly because she'd, she'd ob observed the children for so long that she could see who worked well together. So after discussion and a lot of erasing and rearranging, she really felt like she had a handle on on how to organize at least this classroom. And again, it depends on the class and it depends on the group of kids that you, but that's something you can't get from a book without knowing the kids, I think. So in that example, she really needed to tr apply her learning with a coach in the situation. Well, I mean, the, the obvious one is the behavior issue because no matter how much you read about that, I don't think you can uh, be prepared or know what you're going to do until you're in that situation. Um, so I've had uh, several opportunities to, to be in front of the class where um, something will erupt um, with this child and um, usually Matt um, needs to remove the child from the class. Um, but it's just uh, knowing how you'll manage yourself. So you can read all the theories on, you know, being prepared, staying calm, um, to keep the children calm, and also um, uh, to keep it an isolated incident. But until you're in the situation, you don't know how you're going to react. Um, and so just watching how Matt has, has dealt with that um, has been really useful. I don't think I could have read about the situation. Um, I, it's a very difficult one to document and each child is so unique. Um, so there, of course there are lots of theories that clump certain behaviors together, um, but what being in the classroom and with a specific case has taught me is that you really have to understand the child one-on-one -on -one 
so that you read about that, but until you get here, you know, and, and learn about this individual, um, it doesn't seem tangible from behind the computer until you get into the classroom. Properly used, the addition of situated and embodied learning to a curriculum can add meaning and relevance. More importantly, it may well be the single best tool an educator has for creating real understanding and learning that lasts long after the assessment has ended.